This is episode 60 with surfer and artist Andy Davis. Welcome to Wild Ideas Worth Living, an adventure podcast presented by REI Co-op, the brand who helps get you outside through gear, classes, and adventures. We talk to experts who have taken a wild idea and made it a reality so you can too. From people who have climbed the tallest peaks, started thriving businesses, and even broken records, some of the wildest ideas can lead to the most rewarding adventures. I'm your host, Shelby Stanger, and I hope you enjoy this show. Andy Davis is one of my favorite artists pretty much ever. In fact, he's been called the best surf artist of our generation. His work has appeared everywhere from movies like the movies of surf filmmaker Thomas Campbell to brands like Billabong and Roxy, his own brand Free on big murals and prints, and even more recently in stores like Wes Elm and on the panels of Igloo Coolers. He grew up in the 70s and his art is very influenced by pop culture. It's bright, it's bold, often with curvy lines, feminine undertones, featureless faces, and it just exudes joy and aloha. In a recent feature on Andy in the Adventure Journal by past guest Steve Casimiro, he quotes the surf historian Matt Warshaw, who says, Andy does a lot with what appears to be very little, mostly lines, but in fact, that's one of the hardest things to do. Andy's got a great sense of humor, he has a bold outlook on life, and he offers a really fresh perspective on following your own wild ideas, especially if those ideas are of the creative arena. So we did this interview first at his studio, but then just at my house during one of the best swells of the winter over a Pacifico and guacamole, as it should be. Enjoy the show. I think we should just start with a story. How did dressing like J-Lo land you a huge success in your life? Oh, that's that's where we're going, huh? Um I had on um, an orange juicy suede or velour, I don't know which one it was, uh, sweatsuit. And I had on like a belly chain and pretty fancy like streaked and tip wig and some bedazzled Gucci style shades and lots of makeup on and lots of rings. And I had like a Eve Saint Laurent bag that I had full of suckers that I was like giving to everybody You're and passing out lollipops, passing out parties. lollipops. And yeah, I was in my own world. It was pretty funny. So the reason why I start with his story is because I wanted to paint a picture of Andy Davis. That's a he good one. Is the kind of guy that will dress up as JLo at a Halloween party and he's an artist and he's super talented. I want to also talk about your work. You make joy for a living through your work, which is really cool. I love that. That's what you say. So maybe you could talk, because there's a lot of people who want to be artists listening. What medium do you work best in? Is it pen and paper or acrylic or pastel? I don't know a lot about art. Sorry. Uh, I love to just start everything with drawing, with just either a pencil or a colored pencil, just kind of doodling. And then it just sort of evolves from there, depending on whatever project I'm working on at the time is. And um, then it'll... Go a little further, but when I paint, um, I really like to use acrylics, like really watered down house paint. Um, you can paint over and over and over, and I like kind of getting depth and layers, and I don't really have it dialed the first few times, so I like to work through it, kind of get lost in it. It's a little, it's kind of meditation, so to speak. So yeah, I, I really haven't dabbled in any oils. Um, as far as painting goes, I like to paint with watercolors as well, and then... Um, would yeah. all paintings start with a paper and pencil? For the most part, yeah. There there has been a few times when I just kind of just sort of go without doing anything and just start painting. Um, I'm not very comfortable with doing that at this point, but I, I enjoy it. I just don't really... Big blank canvas and paint. That yeah, sounds scary to it, me. It, it is a little bit, and... Um, yeah, just the last show I had, I actually did it on three fairly big canvases, and it was fun. It was a totally new way of looking at it, and I kind of just, yeah, I just kind of let it happen. Didn't force anything. Do you listen to music when you? Always. Okay. Yeah. And what kind of music's usually on? It depends. It depends on the day. It depends on how much coffee I've had or like <laughs> what other circumstances happened along the way. So um, the sometimes I like to listen to jazz and really mellow stuff. Other times I like to listen to say like, I don't know, like 
some like old like African sixties garage music and dance around and it yeah, I just like that it just takes me to another place and I kind of get lost in it and I just love having music in my world and I kind of always have to have it. Since I, I was a little kid, I love it. I love that. So and you grew up in the seventies, which is a really good time in music. I want to get the name of like an African garage band that I can put on Pandora or Spotify. Just throw in African Scream Contest. It's like a compilation. It's really fun. That's a, a good one. That's a good one. Um, yeah. And and so are you, do you have to have coffee? Do you ever drink beer or have a glass of wine before you paint? Or can you just, can you paint anywhere, anytime? Yeah, I guess I could paint. I mean, I usually start the day with coffee and end with beer. Um, sometimes they both happen in between depending on the day, <laughs> but um, I can, I guess I could paint anywhere. I think the one thing about painting though, like if you're painting for a project or a show or something, it takes a lot of prep. So um, it's nice to have time and yeah. to be able to kind of have everything you need and be able to, you know, come come back to it if you have to walk away instead of like starting all over again um whereas drawing i could definitely do anywhere like drawing a napkin if we're sitting here right now or at dinner or whatever like always doodling is fun but actually like making a painting is is more of a process so. i bet going to mexican food with you is super fun because you're like drawing on the napkins and it can be it, sometimes that happens this is fun to go eat mexican food <laughs> I love Mexican food. We're having some guacamole right now. Um, which and a Pacifico. Is, and a Pacifico. Nice. Perfect. Um, yeah, because right now you, you're you at the point in your career where you have your own studio and you haven't always had your studio. So I'm curious, is is having your own studio necessary or really helpful to how you work? Or can It's a dream. I mean, I feel like I'm so fortunate to have a space. I've always worked at home, um, which is nice too, but it can be distracting. Um, it's really cool to be able to go out really late at night and when it's quiet and get things done, but you can always procrastinate, always find something else to do. So it's nice to actually go to work every day. And, um, I'm so lucky to have this beautiful building that we're in and have a showroom and a gallery and a studio space and place where people can come and see what we're doing. And yeah, I'm, I'm just really excited that it's happening you know that's awesome yeah and his studio way way out there is in solana beach san diego it's beautiful so there's a lot of people here who want to be artists though and they they don't have a studio so if you don't have a studio you can still make art oh, any God, advice yeah. to people who you know, don't have a space yeah just keep making stuff i mean you can make stuff anywhere and it, uh, art to me is anything it can be cooking it can be you know planning things it can be you can be, a, you know, whatever you're super passionate about to me is art. So you can do it wherever you are. I love that. It's figuring any, it out. Any weird places you made a painting? <laughs> yeah, I made a painting a long time ago, um, like on a little fishing shack in like the bowels of Baja. That was fun. Oh, cool. Yeah, it was really fun. I did it for a, a friend's movie and um, it was I had never done that before, and he was doing it all the time. Was it Thomas Campbell's movie? It was Thomas Campbell's For the Present, um, his second surf film that he made a long time ago. And yeah, we went camping, and he was like, we're going to go paint that scene. on this shack. And he actually had me, prior to that, um, paint a wall uh, sort of by South Sapotes outside of Ensenada, and I was so scared. And he was just like, you got to do it, like go do it and what were you scared about was i was it? scared i was gonna go to jail it was in okay, the middle of the day illegal. like right on the side of the road and i was like there's no way and he's like no don't worry like if if the fed are always come we're gonna tell them that you're an artist and that this is like a commission and don't worry about it you're just gonna do it and i i was so paranoid and going so fast and it was embarrassing like when it was all said and done but i guess it was a good story but yeah i wasn't what did you paint i just painted like a guy kind of highlining on a doing a cheater five, like trimming on the nose of a board and with was, style. He's showing I guess, stylish hands. Yeah. <laughs> he kind of doesn't have fingers or a face and it could be a boy or a girl. I like to kind of leave it up to the imagination. I had some friends there with me that were kind of like painting the underpainting really quick and we were all just looking over our shoulders and just like, what are we doing? And Oh, that sounds so fun. That's like it, adventure painting. Yeah. Well, it, Looking back, it was. At the time, it was definitely, I wasn't stoked. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
So yeah, a lot of your art doesn't have, you know, you don't have, they don't have faces or sometimes hands. So tell me a little bit about like these nebulous forms that are so cool. I felt like I used to love to draw faces all the time. And I, I kind of felt at one point, like I like having some ambiguity there. And I liked people f like interpreting in a way of like, oh, that could be me or that could be my friend. And once you start drawing a face there, it becomes like a personality. Whereas it seemed more organic to kind of have it be something that, you know, you weren't looking at those little details that would throw you off. It would be like, Hey, that looks familiar, but it could, it could be something else, you know? And I also liked my favorite surfers are pelicans. And so I was kind of like, Oh, how can I make these people like stretched out and cartoony and almost look like they're birds. And so it was kind of, just a cross between different things that inspired me. And I wanted, I also just kind of liked using different colors. And so it didn't look so literal. Like I don't want to make a perfect painting of a way that looks like a picture. People can do that a million times better than me. And I'm just not that interested in it. To me, I, I wanted to make it seem like this dreamland. And, you know, I, I wanted to see cartoons and surfing. Like I never saw, like I did a little bit, like some Severson stuff and early, Rick Griffin and there was things in some old surf movies that I'd watch, but I was like, Oh, I love all that stuff. And I love it so much. I'm such a nerd for it. Like what if I made my own stuff that was like a combination of all the things I loved in pop culture. And so I just kept working on it. So what else did you love about pop culture? So I love first that you say that pelicans are your favorite. Surfers. Oh, by far they're never in the wrong spot. Never. They Nobody are. ever drops in on them. Like they, <laughs> they surf together. Like, they're they're just perfect placement and trim and they make it just it's just it's epic for those of you listening if you've never seen a pelican ride a wave it is quite fantastic i completely agree and i like that what you said about the ambiguity of of that people can relate to it because i have friends Lindsay and mike who've been collecting your paintings since you were at the surf gallery in laguna beach oh at cool Will Penner thanks guys yeah and they they're like that's us that's us, like the little couple, the guy and the girl. That may not even be a guy and a girl. They're like, that's us. And so they have That's a guy things. and a girl. Yeah, yeah that one is. <laughs> Holding hands, carrying yep. surfboards. But um, so you were talking a little bit about some of your, your influences besides Pelicans and, and John Severson and cartoons. Yeah, I mean, growing up in the 70s, it was all around. I think that, you know, I loved watching cartoons. I loved like Bugs, which ones? Bugs Bunny, yes. uh, all the Looney Tunes. Um, I loved all the Charlie Brown specials. Cause we didn't have as you know, we didn't have cable TV then it was like you had two through 13 and during the seasons, okay, Thursday night, you'd see the ad for it. You know, it's going to be Charlie Brown Christmas or whatever, or the great pumpkin and that kind of stuff. And then just after school, there were certain things, you know, that were on, you know, I loved like Dukes of hazard and the happy days and on the weekend, the Munsters and Gilligan's Island, all, all that stuff we were brought up with. And I just, I loved it. And then I also loved just riding my bike around everywhere and like having adventures in my little suburbia neighborhood with my friends and building jumps and playing, you know, all kinds of sports, playing football in the streets and, you know, look out for the car and, you know, going to the field and playing soccer or baseball and then all the team stuff I had to do. But <laughs> also you'd ride your bike all over town and go to the arcade and go to the record store. And I don't know, there's just tons of freedom. And it was a lot of, uh, there was a lot of fun stimulus around that I was just super drawn to. I was never really excited to be at school other than to see my friends. I couldn't connect. I couldn't retain it. I didn't care about it. I just wanted to have fun and be lost in my own little world that I felt safe in. And so I loved to draw as a kid. I'd go out and play soccer or, or basketball or whatever, and I'd come in and draw it. And I love that the early stuff, that's where I was like, I loved it. Loved it. So I lived across the street. I was born in Fullerton, California. I lived across the street from Cal State Fullerton. And every summer the Rams would come there for like their summer training camp. And so my brother and I would carry their pads and get their autographs. And <laughs> so I'd go home and draw it. And we'd play, you know, football in our yard. And I was just a total little jock nerd until I was, you know, well, I, probably till almost high school because my dad was a coach. And so sports were just always around. Wow. Yeah. That's funny. I grew up with a dad who was an athletic director. So same, same kind of upbringing, played a lot of like stick and ball sports. And then I found surfing and kind of was ruined. <laughs> yeah, me too. And I didn't, I didn't move to the beach until I was a sophomore in high school. And I started surfing when I was 13 and 
I would go to the beach maybe a couple times a year, um, you know, when we were younger, just like riding a boogie board. And I was basically like a dog at the beach. I'd be like chasing birds and digging and running around. And I would love to go in the water, but I really wasn't like drawn to surfing yet. And then I started boogie boarding and, you know, body surfing. And then seeing people surf for the first time and like picking up a surf magazine at like alpha beta back in the day. And then just being like, Whoa, this is like something I've never seen. And I was so into it. Like, that's it. This is what I want. This is the coolest shit ever. Like, this is what I want to do. And I I was like, I'm going to be a pro surfer. Like I was like 10 and never surf, but I'm like, that's what I want to do, you know, but that didn't happen. But you ended (laughs) up becoming kind of a professional artist who has made it in the surfing world, which is so huge because I don't really know any other artists who's made it in the surfing world like you have. There's a lot of people and, and there's there's a lot of super talented people that do all kinds of stuff. Um, I'm just really fortunate. I've had wonderful help from family, my friends, my wife. Like I'm not a one man show do it yourself or by any means. I'm like quite the opposite. It's a little embarrassing, but it's how it is. And I'm totally open to saying it. And I'm just, yeah, super excited that people have shown interest in like helping me along the way. And I feel that, you know, I hope that it wasn't too much of a burden on them, you know, and that it didn't exhaust them and feel like, Hey, like, you know, (laughs) go go do your own thing. You know, I don't know. I've came to your studio and you had all these great people working with you with such eclectic, different backgrounds. Yeah. And they were really talented. Like one of your, one of your friends who works with you is showing his film at Sundance this weekend. And yeah, my friend Randall Christopher, he's, he's premiering at his, his document, his animation, uh, his animated documentary at um, Sundance. And he's done a bunch of different other festivals this year. I've been working with him for about 10 years and, we work on so much together. He does all the animations with me. Like I say, like he's the other side of my brain and he's my other hand. Cause he's, he's a technical wizard. Like I'll sit and art direct with him and have a vision. And he really makes a lot of like my drawings and, you know, ideas I have come to life. And I definitely know what I want to do, but he loves doing that stuff and he's fast. And so I enjoy working with him. It's almost like for in a band, like, he's a drummer, I'm playing the bass or whatever. Like it's, we just sync up and I've always loved that because I've always loved being with friends. And if, if it's like we're doing something together, whatever it is, if, if you're more into that than I am, like let's do it together, but we'll do it how we kind of can balance each other out. How do you find these? I mean, I think that's what's so great is you find these amazing people to work with. And I'm just kind of curious, like how, how you've surrounded yourself and how you You've surrounded yourself with really awesome people, but how do you choose the people you work with and how do you find them? I, in the beginning, wanted to just work with my friends. Um, that's who I wanted to spend all my time with. And I was trying to go school, to school, to art school in the early 90s, and it just kind of was the same path since I was a little kid, education, and just the system wasn't for me. I didn't fit in. And so I s- decided early on to, you know, I had some money to go to school from my family. My grandpa had saved money for us and my brother and my cousins and I, and I went to him and said, Hey, I want to start a clothing brand. You know, I tried to go to art school and which wasn't connecting with it. And I thought I saw the spark go off and I, I said, I can do it. I can do it with my friends. They know a lot of things I don't know. And we all enjoy being together. And I know things that could help them and, I have an opportunity, so let's do it. We're so inspired by surf culture and skate culture and where things were at that time. And we had a lot of things that we liked and we wanted to try. And so we just, I was kind of like, let's do it. You so know, you started, so for those who don't know, Andy started a business with his friends um, yeah. right, right off, right, right after, you know, trying to go to was, school, it didn't work. Was it for you? Maybe we can talk just quickly why it was school, not for you. Because I think there's a lot of people or like, you know, traditional education in some ways, it's not for them, but there's other ways to learn. Yeah. Chunks of my brain weren't in the right place, I guess. I just was really distracted and impatient and then insecure too. I, I, I knew enough to know I wasn't going to be able to give the right answer because I didn't spend the time to learn it. And so I'd kind of be really shy and just sort of sit in the back. And that wasn't my personality. Like I loved being around people and was kind of a class clown, but I knew like you can't go that far because that attention's going to not do you good. So I tried to kind of just toe the line and 
get by and it just got harder and harder because you know you have more responsibility the older you get especially you know when you're in high school and you're like okay it has to happen and I barely got through it you know and I wasn't a bad kid you know I didn't ditch and I wasn't on drugs and you know I didn't do bad things but I just you didn't, just didn't learn that didn't way. connect yeah and no one had ever taught me and like you know be patient this is kind of how you do it my brain was just always going a million miles an hour and I couldn't slow it down I didn't know how to slow it down I didn't want to slow it down I was just like in the moment like let's go we'll figure it out as we go and that's kind of what I'm still doing and I'm I, 48 next month so you do not I'm, look 48 I'm, I'm winging it <laughs> i can't i can only imagine though how your brain works because when you see andy's pa paintings they're just so full of color and they're so creative and they're so vibrant that you are on kind of a different planet i can tell the way your brain works so you didn't go so you tried art school um the story goes you it was like a there was like a computer class and you were tr they were trying to make you do like architecture that was not for you you're like no way I want to take the money that my parents would have spent on school for me and start my own business. Yeah. So you were how old and you started Free, a clothing brand? Yeah, I started Free, a clothing brand when I was 22. And Whew. I had no clue what I was doing. I just knew that's what I wanted to call it and I could see what I wanted it to look like. And this and was what year real quick? It was 1992. Yeah, 92. That was the heyday of when you could have Things like a clothing happening. brand. Yeah. I love the name free. It's like probably one of your, I'm guessing, biggest values, freedom. Yeah, it just felt, that's where I felt in my life at that time. Like I was really just on my own. You know, I, I mean, I did have the family help, which was amazing. You know, and people ask me all the time, how did you get your start? And that's how I got it, you know, 100%. I was so blessed in so many ways to have great people in my life. And it allowed me to have time to, meet people you asked me a minute ago you know how do you how do you meet these people how does this come about and it's, it's time you know it's yeah. it's time on the road it's time exploring it's time sharing and time having experiences to not be forced to say oh you know i have to go do this to, to stay alive and make ends meet you know i was lucky that i didn't have to do that so i got to do other things and you know i didn't I didn't have to struggle in a lot of ways and a lot of ways that that that's hindered me in other parts of my life. But I tried to kind of just go to the light and be happy and, and be excited that I get the opportunity and not take it for granted and, and really be open armed about it. And it's just it led me, you know, it started taking trips to Baja with my friends when I was in my late teens and early 20s and, you know, driving you know, all the way down to Cabo, not crazy stuff like people did in the 60s and the 70s where they drive to Nicaragua and like, yeah, But Sandy you know, to Cabo is no joke. It, it was it was fun. And it was the first time I'd ever done like long trips with just my friends. And then, you know, we do the same thing and go snowboarding and like, you know, we go to Tahoe yeah. or Utah or Mammoth or wherever, like all over. And you'd skateboard all along the way and go to thrift stores and like be together and sleep on somebody's floor. And it was just totally amazing adventures. And so free was kind of like, oh, that's a no brainer. Like. Yeah, that's it. So free was the clothing brand. It started at 22 and it's not around today or it is? No, but I mean, it lives forever. It lives forever. Yeah. What was the biggest, what was like the hardest lesson you learned in business early on? Well, the main thing I wanted to do is I really had an intention of paying back my grandpa and like making him super proud and like, oh my gosh, if I could do that, like that would be the biggest monumental thing I've ever pulled off. And so the fact that I, long story short, didn't was kind of a crusher but you got to move on and keep going. So that was, I think, one of the things that I wanted to do that I didn't. And I think the other thing that was so important to the my evolution was trying to realize if you're going to do something on your own, you need to know how to do all of it. And I wasn't that type of person at all, and I'm still not now. And so I always like to surround myself with other people, and that can be good and bad because, you know, if, if you're supposed to be the leader and the captain of the ship and you don't know where you're going, people get lost and they don't understand. And, it, you know, they have their own lives. And it, it, can get, it can get kind of off course. And so, you know, I was putting responsibilities on other people because they were the ones that were put in place to do that. Like in the beginning, I'm like, hey, look, I'm not – the back end, you know, like yeah. I'm the creative vision and 
this is what I want to do. I always kind of like, we're an NBA franchise, you know, here's the person in, in, who's the general manager. Here's the coach. Here's the players. That's great. I, I was like, it's I'm not, I'm not a one man machine. Yeah. Like I'm the farthest thing from that. And all my good friends know that. And they were accepting of it. And it was like, Hey, you're going to do this. You're going to do this. I'm going to do this. But I think if you really want to start your own business and be successful, like you need to know how to do it all yourself. And I, and you know, I still don't do that. I still kind of, my wife does everything like she's she's amazing all the shit she can handle she doesn't run the business not only run the business i mean you know is is 10 times more creative 10 times more talented but she's been mom and like sacrifice responsibility like when i first met her she was traveling around the world making a girl's documentary on her own dime you know all no no company behind her just like hey i'm gonna figure this out she was doing a girl's surf documentary yeah called soul sirens like in the early 90s oh no not early 90s early 2000s sorry she'd been doing it the wife you met in the j-lo costume that's right ashley that's right ashley ashley carney davis is her name now but yeah but so anyway, <laughs> if you could go, so, so now though, I, I actually think, you know, there's a lot of people in business who say that's actually the smartest thing to do is to hire people who know more than you in each of their fields. And you've kind of done that. I've yeah. tried. I think so. So I kind of disagree with you, but, um, that's but I think it's great what you've done and, and it is important to kind of know how to do it all, but it's impossible to know how to do it all. Like, you know, art and you're really good at it. So the business of art is what's really tricky and you've been able to make a living doing art. Is there any advice you can give to people on how to like paint and are really good or who doodle or who draw, how they can monetize it? Because I know that's a tricky thing, but a lot of people want to be able to do what they live and maybe get paid for it. Yeah, I think timing is is essential and I think you got to do it anyway. You got to just be passionate about it and if it's meant to be it'll come if you're doing it um but just sort of setting out and saying i'm going to make a living doing one thing i think your path needs to to evolve a little bit you have to really just be so embraced and and what you believe in and why you're doing it that it's not about making any money it's just you have to let that out and then eventually like opportunity comes like you know, you're just, you're so, you become so immersed and you start meeting people and, and things just happen organically. I know it sounds crazy, but no, I believe you have, you have to be doing it first. You can't just think like, oh, I'm going to do it. And I've, I've got it all figured out. I've, I've resourced and I have all this information and I got it. It's like, you got to go do it. So you did it. You made art for years before you started getting paid decently for it. Correct? Yeah, I tried. I mean, I don't know how, how, how good it was or what it, there was never an intention of I'm going to be an artist. I'm going to show in galleries. I was like, I want to make a clothing brand with my friends and yeah. it's creative and it's fun, but I'd never thought of myself as like, I'm going to be an artist. I just always love to make stuff. And so I, I, it just happened that way th- again, through my path and being around people that inspired me and I watched what they did. And I was like, Oh my gosh, that's so cool. Like this is happening. And I, and I love, where I'm at in, in this part of my life in my mid twenties, you know, to early thirties. And I just got these great opportunities and experiences. And, you know, when things didn't go the way I wanted, I didn't really dwell on it for too long. I just sort of went, okay, that's where I am right now today, but there's tomorrow. Sounds and, like you're really good at flowing. Like if something's uh, hard, you let it go. If something feels really good, you keep following it. There's there's good and bad to that. That's again one of those things. Like yeah, that's how I work, and I definitely don't force things. I've tried a few times in my life; it doesn't work for me. I'm much better if I just let go and go with the flow, and then things just find their way back in. But if I really stress on it and worry, it, it just ends up getting worse and worse and worse. And instead, I just try and like be aware of what's happening, manifest where I want to go, and let go after I manifest it. And then over time it somehow comes back in. It's, it's good advice. Um, it sounds crazy. And no, it's good. It probably, you wouldn't work for, it probably wouldn't work for everybody just, but for me it, it has. And. Well, now you're working with so, so early on you've worked with Billabong, Roxy, all these great surf brands. And now you're working with, you know, West Elm. There's a great install inside West Elm and your art is now coming out on Igloo coolers, which is so cool because now, 
you know, coolers are usually just like boring, white, blue, whatever. But now the panel's got like Andy Davis art. I love it. I mean, art can be everywhere. Maybe you can just tell me like, do you pitch these brands? Do they pick you? Or these are these things that also come kind of naturally sort of? All three of those things. Yeah. Over time, you just build, build up a portfolio and you build up a network of, you know, just resources. And again, by being there and doing it, things happen. I did want to get outside of surfing for quite some time and do things in other departments and categories. And I brought on some new partners that have different backgrounds. And we were sort of trying to come up with a game plan of like, let's let's talk about some other companies that you'd like to work with, that you like what they represent, what they're all about. And I've worked with so many different people in, in the surfing and skateboarding world, action sports, if you want to call it or whatever they call it. But <laughs> I've done a lot of that and I'm super lucky. And so those experiences have led me to continue to go forward. And so, yeah, I, I you know, got to work with Igloo and Igloo to me is, is such a fun company that was such a part of my childhood. You know, everybody had the Igloo Playmates, you know, they were always around and they still are the same ones. Like they're a well-built American product and it, you know, it's small company that's been around for well not small anymore but 70 years in little town in texas and they're still doing it you know and they're just they're just how they are and they've never done a collaboration before i know collaboration is not any new thing but for me i'm so excited it, it's such a cool opportunity and no pun intended but uh <laughs> yeah it's it's going to be a lot of fun we just got the first um first batch like a limited edition of 500 came in and they're like at specialty retailers and yeah, there's plans to do a lot more with it. So, you know, I'm really excited about the potential of that. And I've, I've been working with a friend who um, builds these beautiful homes that are inspired by like mid-century modern kind mm -hmm. of Scandinavian Japanese, Love you know, it. influence. And he and I have been surfing together and I've been doing kind of collaborating with him on some of his homes and he makes like one a year and we do art for him. The new one that he's doing in Cardiff, which is right very close to where we are right now. We're going to be doing, working on some tiles and some wallpaper and wow. all some murals and some just big cutout installation stuff. So I love just working in all kinds of mediums and I've been around in the surf world for a long time, but I kind of always wanted to do other stuff. My mom was an interior decorator. And oh. so always kind of like try to like, make my space that I'm in, you know, to make me feel like I have all the things around me that I love and Can you come keep it cozy. Our yeah. house. No way, you guys, this house is cool. I love it. Oh, that's so awesome, Andy. It sounds like there's so many opportunities on the horizon. So you've got Igloo. I know there's other brands that have been contacting you. How do you choose who you say yes to? I think it, it has to do with just a connection of energy. It sound, Again, it sounds weird, but you can meet certain people and you can just tell they're genuine and you yeah. want to work with them. It seems like, hey, we have the same interests and we're excited to meet each other and there's opportunity here. And other times you just kind of can see through the bullshit and look, this isn't going to work. I've been in those situations yeah. too. And it happens. That's business. I don't like business, to yeah. tell you the truth. Like I, I kind of force myself through it, but at the same time I feel really... Yeah, and I keep saying it. It's probably I've never done a podcast, by the way. In case He's you can't doing tell. great on this podcast. No, but how do you how do you reject people? Is there a good way that you reject people? Politely decline. You politely decline. Okay. Yeah. Or <laughs> or act smile. act super aloof and just kind of oh yeah you know like uh, sorry I'm just the crazy artist I didn't I don't look at emails I didn't <laughs> sorry you know no I right, we just gave away Andy's big no, secrets no if secrets. he's not responding. Um, There's no secrets. I no I try and really just. Again, I feel really, you know, fortunate that people want to do something with me. Yeah. So. One of the things I think a lot of artists I know, they're they're scared. They're scared. To, I have a friend who's a really great artist, but he like won't put his work out on T-shirts, on surfboards, on anything. And it drives me absolutely nuts. Any advice I can give him to just, or any artist out there on just getting over the fear of putting your work out there? I think they have to want to do it yeah. you know i mean if you if you naturally are feeling like you want to share what you're doing you just give it to a friend you don't have to sell it i mean that's not why you're making it you know give it because you wanted to let it out and you know share it with somebody 
And I think that if you just start doing that and the more you immerse yourself in it, opportunity will happen in some way or another. Do you want to tell me some of the art you've given to friends? I used to love making friends mixtapes and just, you know, drawing on the, the cover of them and stuff. Or, you know, when I'd, it'd be somebody's birthday, I'd make them a card or make them, you know, a little funny sketch. We used to draw each other all the time, like <laughs> take such mangled characters of each other that like take their worst insecurity and just blow it up by a thousand. <laughs> I love just it. Just as, as kids would do. So we're always doing that. I really and- want to ask if you like draw it's totally an appropriate question, but I laugh so hard when there's like a giant male organ drawn in the sand on the beach when I'm running. And it just, just makes me laugh. Like I remember that running in Raglan and it was yeah. the worst run ever and it was sand raining. Wieners. And then I saw a sand wiener and I just started <laughs> dying laughing and it made the run go so much faster. Sorry, I didn't mean so you to have go a great, there. But no, you have I, a great personality. Was, That's perfect. I was a little curious if you ever draw, you know. No, I don't ever draw wieners or sand wieners. Well, maybe it, but I think that would one. be fun. Maybe I'll start drawing those. <laughs> um, okay, well, I think we've come to the quick and dirty round faster <laughs> than we thought. But first, a word from our sponsor. This episode was brought to you by REI Co-op, a brand who not only gets you the gear you need to get outside, but helps you get out there and explore. Anytime I've had a big adventure, whether it was volunteering in Costa Rica, even hiking in Yosemite, I've loaded up on gear at REI. I've always loved their inclusive approach and the fact the brand provides tons of education on and off the storefront floors. I've taken lots of classes at REI, like orienteering, rock climbing techniques, even beginning backpacking. They also have great experiences and trips like safaris to Tanzania, trekking in the Alps, backpacking trips through the Great Smoky Mountains, and so many more. I've been a member since 1996, and I'm excited to partner with them on the show this year. You can go to REI.com to check out the latest gear, classes, experiences, to find a store near you, and to read great stories about adventure and the outdoors. So we're, we're in the quick and dirty round now. I'm just going to ask you quick questions. Weirdest fan reaction i know you show at galleries and you have to be there i think probably stuff in japan has been the weirdest (laughs) yeah it's a little crazy there i'm a lot taller than everybody you probably look (laughs) so different there yeah they think they think i'm some weird muppet or something (laughs) i'm gonna show so y'all go on instagram see pictures of andy davis and y'all just laugh that he says he looks like a muppet very very handsome character get ready handsome favorite thing to do with your son so you have a 13 year old so you're yeah. a, you're a rad dad oh i don't know i just try and do my best <laughs> i have an awesome wife who's an aw- amazing mom so that helps um i love just being with him and making him laugh and having him make me laugh and just seeing i feel so blessed that he's happy and healthy and That's awesome. he's a sweet sweet kid and He's fun to be around, you know. And thirteen, he must say some funny things. Yeah, he's classic. He's he's getting really into surfing and skating, and loves music, and but he still loves to play Legos and I love that hide and seek, and you know, shoot Nerf guns and be a kid. Fun. You know, go on exploration. So yeah, we're we're. Does he draw? Thankful, he does. Yeah, he he's he's really he. Is good at it, but he just doesn't spend a lot of time at it. But his drawings are epic. They're so fun and Napoleon Dynamite like, and Love it. they're just the rawest, coolest things. When he was really little, they were out of control. Like I wanted to have an art show with him because I'm just like, fuck these things. Like these should be in a museum. They're so funny and clever, and just just rattle off left and right like stacks them. I still have them all. So maybe one day I will do that, but I didn't want to exploit them. I don't have a son, by the way. I'm just making this up. <laughs> He totally has his son. That's good for you. I think that would be really fun to do an art show with dad and son. And, and wifey. And she wife. just did she's one. Hers, such a badass. hers knocked it out of the park. Yeah, she's the one we need to be doing a podcast on. All right, about. Ashley, you're coming on next. Yeah, she's much more And we should exciting. surf with her because she's a pro. She can show me a few she's, tips. She's a great surfer. Yeah, she she's, she's one in a million. So what's your favorite date with your wife? We don't go on dates. Come on. <laughs> no, we don't ever. <laughs> I'm not kidding. What would be your dream date with your wife? Uh, I would love to go surf a point break with her and my son, all three of us. Um, 
somewhere warm, somewhere uncrowded, somewhere where we could relax. We and a left. Left, we're we're goofy goofs. Um, goofy know, footers for yeah, those who don't goofy know foot. what that is. Yep, that means right foot forward, gang. <laughs> right, right foot forward. So a point break, and then if you weren't living in San Diego, um, where would you live? I think answering that super quick right now, New Zealand. Yeah. Um, I've been there. I loved it. My wife's been there. She loved it. It was a really special place that I would love to get back to. Um, I don't travel much these days and I miss it. Um, but I think that's another thing of sacrificing living where we live. You know, it's expensive yeah. and being here is, is a great place in a lot of ways. And so sometimes I just realize that and I count my blessings. I'm like, you know, it's great here, you know, especially um, the crowded waves and the bikers. <laughs> just easy. I love the crowded waves and I love the bikers. <laughs> um, so no, I think that's great. You, you have a lot of gratitude in, in what you do. And I, I agree. New Zealand is actually our place where we'd live if we weren't living here. So what party would you throw? If you could throw any party, like what band is playing? Who's there? What kind of food are we eating? What are we drinking? We're drinking beers. Lately, I've been loving kombucha beers. Oh, I, I almost bought kind you of, a booch craft. Kind of, that's what I've. That's been my my thing lately. Um, good, healthy food. Um, I was a hor. I had a horrible diet growing up. So for about the last twenty years, I eat pretty well. Um, friends there that make me laugh. I have a group of friends that I just would be so happy to have at like a fun private party. And then, you know, there's people that I've always, you know, love just watching. Like I love Zach Galifianakis and Jack Black. And I love people that are funny and make fun of themselves and just are smart and witty. And um, as far as a band, I'm going to see Ty Siegel at the belly up next week. So he'd be pretty sick to have this, you know, at our own thing. And he seems really cool too. Every time I watch like, interviews with him stuff and he's from Laguna Beach and was a surfer and was just a nerd for music and he's just if you don't know who he is check out Ty Siegel he rules we will put that in the show notes okay so any other advice to artists keep making stuff keep making stuff you always make it. stuff there's so much that's accessible now that's good and bad I mean I loved going and finding things going through thrift stores and bookstores and looking at magazines and I find myself on device devices now more and uh, it's good because it's quick, but it kind of takes the adventure out of it and holding something in your hand and smelling it and feeling it and seeing that there was like actual people that like put time and energy into this and there's like a story behind it is romantic and I have that stuff all around me. So even when I am on my device, um, I try and balance it out with things that I had not so long ago before I didn't have devices. That's good advice to check your device. Yeah, with, that's for, see, with you're, you're real, way better at this than I no, am. No, you're great at this. So check your device with the real thing. Okay, if you could draw, you know, on all the billboards, advertising Budweiser, whatever they're advertising, what would you draw right now? Aloha. I love that. Yeah, everybody needs to just relax. And it's crazy. It seems like the time we're in right now is a really strange place on our little universe that we're in our ball that we're on. And, uh, you, you just hear everybody's pain and suffering. And, but what comes out of that, especially like in the hardest times is like the most love. And I think like for whatever, for whatever everyone wants to say about Trump, love him or hate him. Like the guy's going to make everybody change. And I think there's a reason for that. I don't believe in politics anyway. I think it's all bullshit. But for whatever reason, the guy's in place and he won't be forever. <laughs> and, you know, things will keep evolving like they always have. It's just like it's a pocket, you know, and we got to just keep getting up and going. But I, I love the fact like when things happen, you know, communities come together and they drop everything and they just help each other. And I think human nature that's how we are as people. There's, there's not nice people in the world because they've had a hard life or something's wrong in their brain and issues. But there's all these amazing people with a lot of love, like women. Women are so special. Like none of us would be here. Like, <laughs> uh, like a mother's love 
is unconditional. It brings life to the planet. And I think that's why we're still here and why we've sustained as a race because there is so much love. But the money and the media doesn't want to talk about that. Oprah might. She kind of does. She connects with people. She's pretty epic. Hey, this has been such a pleasure. <laughs> you rocked it. Oh, it was fun talking to you. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Andy Davis, thank you so much for coming over for Take Two, Guacamole Pacifico style. And to you, wherever you are listening, thank you for listening to this show. For more on Andy, we'll have links on the show notes on wildideasworthliving.com. You can also check out his gallery way, way out there in Solana Beach. And if you get the latest copy of the Adventure Journal magazine, there's a great piece on Andy by Steve Casimiro, who's been a guest of this show. He says, there's a little bit of shagging Andy Davis and a bit of Scooby too. It's actually an epic article. So thank you again for listening to this show. I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you to REI for supporting us. I'm hopefully in Mammoth right now as you're listening. Snowboarding, it'll probably be sunny, but I'll be super stoked. So thank you again. And thank you for writing reviews on iTunes. We're getting some great reviews on iTunes. It means a lot and reviews are what help the show grow. So here's one by CC Fit 1313 who on January 25th wrote, what's awesome about this show is Shelby doesn't pretend to know everything. True. Heck, she doesn't even pretend to be an expert on podcasting. True. <laughs> She's uniquely and totally herself, which makes her interviews unique. And then it goes on to say, this podcast actually makes me feel like my goals and dreams are possible. It has tangibly made my life a little better, which is super rad. I kind of abbreviated that, but if I can make one person's life a little bit more rad, that is why I do what I do. So that feels really good. So thank you again for listening. We have some great shows coming up. We have Brendan Leonard of Semi Rad, Stacey Bear of Adventures Not War, Donna Carpenter, the CEO of Burton Snowboards, some kids from Outdoor Outreach, and more. We'll see you next week. 